Developing Tomorrow's Leaders is a podcast that is all about educating, supporting, and inspiring the next generation of leaders. Your host, Antoine Thompson, or Coach T, has over 35 years experience of educating, supporting, inspiring, and enhancing the lives of many young men and women. Join Coach T and his village of inspiration. Welcome to Development Tomorrow's Leaders. I'm your host, Antoine Thompson, and I'm super delighted today to have a special guest, a very special guest, a starter on the 1982 National Championship team with James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Michael Jordan, and Jimmy Black. He was also the head coach at Notre Dame and was voted the 2001 National Coach of the Year. I mean, coached the Tar Heels from 2000 2003. And during that time, they were ACC regular season champions in 2000. And he actually recruited the players that eventually won the 2005 National Championship team. He also coached at Florida Atlantic University as well as SMU. Um, he's an author with a book, Rebound from Pain to Passion. And he owns his company, Doherty Coaching Practice, and is author, speaker, leadership development, and team building expert. Also hosts a live webcast, The Rebound. Please help me welcome Coach Matt Doherty to Development Tomorrow's Leaders. How are you today, Coach? I'm, I'm great, Coach. Thank you for having me on, man. It's uh, uh, it's my favorite topic uh, to talk about leadership and and uh, especially when it uh, you, you touch young people because uh, they need to learn how to deal with a lot that's going to be coming their way in, in the future. Yes, ad adversity, absolutely. I want to ask you a quick uh, basketball question because this is one of a big Tar Heel fan, obviously. So talk about that and then know about the amazing run you guys had and being on that uh, championship team. Jimmy Black, in my opinion, is so underrated as a point guard. Would you not agree with that? Oh, yes, uh, I, I, I would agree with that. He was a guy that led Dean Smith to his first national championship. And, right. Uh, he was the leader, the captain of that team. When he was on the court, he settled everybody down. He he was the one who passed the ball to Michael Jordan to hit the game-winning shot against Georgetown in 1982. So uh, Jimmy's one of one, one of my favorite people. And when we talk about leadership, I'm getting goosebumps talking about him. He was the ultimate leader. Uh, we called him boss man because he was the boss on the court. And we're talking about James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Michael Jordan. You talk about talent, but we all took Jimmy's lead. Yeah. And and I only bring that up because, you know, as a, as a basketball coach, you always look at the dynamics of a team. And, you know, when, when you look at that starting five, I mean, just a, a powerhouse team and you you got accolades, Sam and James and Michael, but I always felt like Jimmy didn't get his just due. But you know what's great about that? Jimmy probably was just fine with that as long as the team won, which ultimately you did. Jimmy, um, yeah, I, I, you know, everyone, you know, everyone, it, it, the tough thing in sports is the comparisons, right? You're wired to compete and compare against the other team, the other player, and – to turn that off is hard. And, and I think that's a real challenge for a lot of athletes, especially and coaches that end up morphing into the real world when you're not playing any longer. And, and I've had this conversation with uh, an Olympic speed skater, Chad Hedrick, who I'll have on my rebound live webcast, um, It'll come out next year. We'll record in November. He was an Olympic athlete, gold medal winner, Olympic speed skater. And at 32, he retires. And then he has to assimilate into the real world with some skills that are transferable, but some that he has to develop. And, right. and, 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 I had a Bob Delaney on uh, a webcast I do, and he's, he, he was a former NBA ref. He said, you know, basically, I think to be great, you have to be obsessed and you have to identify with it, whether you're a coach or an athlete or inventor or. But he said, if you your identity is in what you do when you don't, you aren't. 
when your identity is what you do, when you don't, you aren't. And when he, Bob Delaney said that, it was like, wow. And, and I think that's a hard thing for athletes to, to deal with. I know I had a hard time dealing with it, uh, Antoine. I was a starter, as you said, on the national championship team. I was right there next to Michael Jordan and James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Jimmy Black in the locker room, on the bus, team meals front cover Sports Illustrated. I don't make the NBA in 1984. I go to work on Wall Street. I'm miserable. I'm I'm running down Broadway, trying to stay in shape, thinking maybe I'll try to make a comeback and play in Europe. And all of a sudden, the bus pulls up next to me. And on the side of the bus is a picture of Michael Jordan, Spread Eagle, dunking the basketball over the Chicago skyline. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, literally less than a year prior, I was his teammate. I was sharing meals with him, sharing bus rides with him, sharing locker rooms with him. And then there's the great divide, <laughs> the great separation, I call it. And that is very was very difficult for me. I, I was drinking heavily at the time. I ended up uh, realizing I was an alcoholic, gave it up. Uh, but it was very tough. And I thought if that was tough for me, who comes from a pretty good family and, you know, have a faith in my life, that's going to be tough for a lot of other people. And so I like to talk about it because I know I'm not the only one. Right. No, no, no. Totally understand. I appreciate you sharing that. That's uh, that just that has to be quite surreal to go from that one extreme to the other and realizing it's almost like overnight when that you, you see in that bus and, and seeing Michael on, on the side of that bus. Um, but this is um, a great. Actually, I'm, I'm going to surprise you with something because it's going to kind of lead into uh, a big part of what we're going to be talking about. And it's going to be about your book, stuff like this. So, you know, Victoria Hill fan and you probably did a lot of things over the years and probably don't remember what you've done. Well, years ago, I was working at Carolina Country Club in Raleigh and there was this big silent auction going on. And I saw this thing and I'm like, oh man, it's all this Carolina stuff. I've got to get that. I got to get that. I want that. I want that. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to, you know, if, number one, we weren't supposed to be bidding as employees, but I was just a manager. I'm like, oh, I'm going to anyway. So I went over. And I kept checking. It's like 30 minutes later, I, I left and I went looked over. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm still winning this thing. Oh, God, please, please let me get this thing. So I win it. What it is, is an autograph ball from the team that you recruited that won a national championship. And all of the players, Jack Emanuel, uh, Rashad McCants, uh, Jawad Williams, um, Melvin Scott, and yourself autographed this ball. And it's been sitting in a case for 22 years. How about that? And, and I just took it out uh, this morning. So I wanted to show this to you. So for those, this is both video and audio. So for you all that can't see it, it's got um, all of the autographs on there. It's a UNC leather embroidered basketball. And uh, so I just thought that might be something that you yeah. would like to see. How much do you pay for that? Do you really want to know? Yeah. 225 225. That's a yes. pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got a, I got a funny story for you that I, I finally admitted on air yesterday. I do a radio show. I'm a guest on Brett Winterbull's WBT radio show each Thursday in Charlotte. And for some reason I had to confess, and this is built up over 40 years. And, um, in 1982, we won the national championship. And a sports reporter comes to my dorm room and we were on the first floor and, and either knocked on my window or whatever. And he asked me to get eight basketball signed, eight. And I couldn't say no. I'm a nice guy. Uh, plus, you know, he's a sports reporter. Didn't want to disappoint him. He was on on. I think his name was Don Shea. He was he was on Raleigh TV. And uh, so I, I said, you know what? I said to myself, I'm going to ask my teammates to sign one ball. 
So I go around and get them to sign one ball because I didn't want them to have to like sign eight balls. That's a burden. And, and then I'd have to shuffle them through my, my room. I'm going to bring them one ball. I'm going to get them to sign it. And then I'm going to copy their signatures on the other seven balls. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so I, I proceed to take the one ball that they sign and put it on my desk in my dorm room at Granville Towers. And then I take the other seven balls and I copy the signatures. Well, the problem was I'm kind of anal. And as you see that ball that you just showed, the autographs are all over the place, right? They're not lined up. Well, when I signed the ball, I put two names to a panel and they were all in order. Because that's, uh, that's my nature, right? I like to put things in boxes and organize them and, you know, making sure things are lined up right on my desk. And so a couple of months later, I go to a guy's house for dinner, a local lawyer, a friend of my parents. He invites me over, come over for dinner. It was spring of 82. And he says, hey, hey, I got something I want to show you. And he brings me into his living room. And on the mantle is an autographed Carolina basketball. And as soon as I saw it, I realized that's one I signed. <laughs> and I go, I'm not a good poker player, uh, Antoine. So I'm like, uh, 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 um, how, mu how, uh, how much did you pay for it? And now this is 1982. You paid 225 in 2005, 1982. He told me he paid $400 for it. And I was like, oh, 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 that's, that's, oh, wow, that's really nice. <laughs> um, you know, and I couldn't get out of that living room fast enough. <laughs> yeah. So there's seven 1982 national championship balls going around the circuit that I signed. Yeah. Boy, if they go and get those things authenticated, boy, you're in trouble. <laughs> I, figured, I wait 40 years to confess, and I, I, I think there's got to be a statute of limitations. Or something. Oh, there's got to be. There's got to be. No, you're good. You're good. But this is one of those things that you, you know, it, it, obviously for you, you, you see in that, you know exactly what that's all about. And it just takes you back and, and knowing what these gentlemen accomplished. And I think I also show you that to make sure that our listeners know Yes, Roy Williams may have coached those gentlemen when they won that national championship, but you were responsible for bringing them to the University of North Carolina, and I think that credit should be given where it's due. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's nice of you, Antoine. I appreciate it. But Coach Williams had to coach them and bring them together and make them play as one, and, and uh, you know, he did that as probably well as any coach ever, not named Dean Smith. Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, real quick, too. I, I think I mentioned to you once, too, I had the pleasure of coaching uh, Coach Smith's grandson my first two years at the school where I coach now. Did uh, you really? Sam, Sam Combs. Sure did. No kidding. Yes. Now, did you make sure that he pointed to the passer? Oh, we do. Oh, we still do that to this day. Oh, my gosh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the Carolina way is the only way I coach it. That, there you go. To, to your point, Coach Smith uh, truly transformed the game, and it's still his legacy is seen in every game uh, that you see, and so many players do that. But um, but I want to get to really, and, and just so you know why I wanted to have you on. About four months ago, about five months ago, I watched a, a podcast that you had that you did with Shaman Williams, and I was kind of going through, and I was like, oh, let me watch this. And as I'm going through and listen to you tell from the time you came up from, from uh, New York, a uh, high school superstar and being recruited by the University of North Carolina and telling you your story about, you know, playing with this national championship team and your journey through as a coach. It was what you talked about and your time as a coach at Carolina, the time after and how you overcame that and to be where you are today. And as I watched that, I'm like, wow, that takes courage, grit, and passion. And I said, that's something a lot of people can learn from. And I said, knowing what I do, work with young people, this is somebody I have to have on to talk about the importance of from pain to passion. And I think that's what your book is titled, Rebound, From Pain to Passion. I would love for you to share a little bit more about that. 
Well, I appreciate that. I, I uh, have a copy of the book. Um, matter of fact, I'm giving it to a client today. Um, this is the copy of the book, Rebound from Pain to Passion, uh, for the people who are watching uh, this podcast. The, uh, you know, it was very therapeutic to write the book. Writing a book, if you really write it yourself, is hard. It takes a lot of work. And fortunately, I had a good uh, PR person. I had a good publisher that that really held me accountable because it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a lot of work. But ever since I lost my job at North Carolina, I, I would journal some things and it was thinking, well, what if I write a book someday? And then I'm thinking, you know, as a kid from an Irish Catholic family on Long Island, like who would read my book? Like who cares if I would write a book? But I ended up deciding to write the book. I, I've seen other people write books and in my profession as an executive coach and a public speaker, it would help. It's almost like a business card, gives you credibility. But what I didn't realize in writing the book is that a couple of things. One, if I make an impact on one person's life, it was worth it. And I've had multiple people thank me for writing the book because they went through some hardship and, and they didn't know how to deal with it. And uh, as Bob Delaney, who was on, I, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Rebound Live webcast that I do, it's a free webcast I do every month. Um, he was on, and we were talking about trauma. And when I grew up, I thought trauma was a car accident. I thought trauma was a head injury. But trauma can be an emotional scarring event, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, betrayal. And as he would say, it, it's a, it's a, it doesn't have to bleed to hurt. And I think sometimes those are the, the, I'd rather get cut. I'd rather have surgery than, than feel betrayed by my alma mater and lose my job in, in 2003. Um, that was hard. And, and as a male, especially, we're not wired to talk about it. As a male, especially as an athlete, you're wired to try to overcome it and act like you're tougher than the problem. And so that's what I try to do. I had good advice. I had good mentors. But by writing the book, then I got to spill it out. Unfortunately, I had to relive it. But I got to spill it out. And the best thing you could do with trauma is talk about it. Write about it. Because then you release it. And, and that's what I did. So I think the unintended consequence of writing the book was a very, it was very therapeutic for me. Yes. Well, I'm pretty sure it was. Like I said, you outlined a few things in there that, again, like I said, as I heard them, like, wow, you know, you really had to go inside yourself and go, hey, this is, you have to reflect on the experience to yeah. overcome the experience. And some of the things that you said you would have done differently. It's like, yeah, you can go back in hindsight and go, hey, I should have, would have. And but you learn from those experiences. And I think that that's the big thing. And I want to share a, a testimonial that uh, was written about your book. It says Matt's odyssey from high school basketball star to NCAA champion to Wall Street businessman to big time college coach to redefining, rebranding himself is both interesting and inspiring. So I think that that's a testament to the depths of which you went when in writing this book who who would who, who whose endorsement was that uh i didn't get i didn't put the name on okay. on that one but that, that, uh, that sounded pretty good i like that one i gotta, I gotta, <laughs> well, I gotta thank that person that, that that's a that's a pretty good uh i was blessed to have so many people write good endorsements for me that uh it it really was very flattering and humbling. It's humbling. Um, it's humbling and, and life can be humbling at times. And I think that your biggest strength, your biggest weakness. And that's one thing that I've learned through this journey is my strength as a competitor, my intensity, my swift reactions, 
are good when you're on the basketball court and you're on the playgrounds of New York. But when you're in the boardroom or as a leader of the basketball program at North Carolina, those strengths aren't always good. They turn into weaknesses. And, and I, I talk about having an emotional boundary around you and you got to stay within that emotional boundary. And when I would get in trouble and when most people get in trouble, they go beyond that boundary, that imaginary line. And for me, that line was, you know, being competitive, 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 too intense, too intense, too hard on your opponent, too hard on your players, too hard on your coaches. Um, and so I still learning like th this is the thing about leadership. Uh, Antoine, leadership is a skill that ne continues to need to be practiced. I, I, I relate it to golf. Like you see the best golfers in the world. I went to the President's Cup in Charlotte. And I've been to other events at, at, at Quail Hollow where you see these pro golfers. I mean, from Tiger Woods to Phil Mickelson to all the greats. They're on the range early, before the round, and they're on the range after the round. And they're continuing to practice. And I start to sound like Allen Iverson. Um, we're talking about practice. Practice. And so you, you know, if you just take a lesson in golf and then think, oh, I'm going to play on the PGA Tour, it ain't going to happen. And you could shoot 65 on Thursday and then blow up and shoot an 80 on Friday. Well, that's leadership. So you need to continue to practice your skill as a leader. And what are those skills? Uh, include the skill of inclusion, bringing people together, uh, uh, the skill of emotion, emotional uh, intelligence, you know, touching the, the hearts of the people you lead, uh, the skill of managing a, a room, a, a, a meeting, how do you manage the meeting? How do you run a meeting? Um, and the skill, and this is the toughest skill for me, is dealing with events that pop up. And when I talk about events, I'm talking about somebody interrupting you, somebody reacting poorly to a comment you make, somebody, um, you know, whether it be in, 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 in the meeting, out in the warehouse where for me, it was on the basketball court and in a team meeting, you know, if a player said or did something I didn't like, I reacted sometimes too quickly. And a friend of a guy I follow on, on social media, Tim kite, he has a formula called E plus R equals O where E is the event and R is your reaction and O is the outcome. And the only thing we control Antoine is the R we can't control what's someone going to say to us or do to us, but we can co control the reaction and the better our reaction, the better the outcome. So I'll give you an example. Growing up in New York, somebody cuts you off on the expressway, you know, you chase them, you cut them off and flip them the bird. They cut, they drive by you and shoot you in the head. Now that's extreme, right? Right. But if, I would have let them go. Yeah, they cut me off and I got emotional. I want to compete and I want to tell them that they're wrong and show that I'm, I'm right. If I didn't race up and cut them off and react to them, that just escalated the issue. And so my, that's an exaggerated example. But those are things happen all the time. Somebody cut you off in a grocery store. Somebody, somebody says something to you in practice. Somebody says something to you in the office, you know, that offends you and you react. We got to measure our reactions and the better we react, the better the outcome. And that's a skill that we can practice. It's like special situations as a basketball coach. Dean Smith practiced late game situations all the time down to one second to go at a bounce sideline down 10, five minutes to go down three, 10 seconds to go 
down up three, 10 seconds to go. Other team has the ball, you know, practice those situations. So then when you're in those situations, you react accordingly. Really? Well, the same things happen in our relationships and the same things happen in our jobs. The boss is going to say something to you that you don't like. And you could tell him to pound sand. Yeah, then you're out of a job. Or flip it around. The boss could be in a bad mood and go to you and say, Antoine, man, you know, I don't like the shirt you're wearing today. And you can say, you know what? I'm tired of working for this guy. I'm out. Well, it's hard to find higher talent nowadays in the workforce. So you better treat your people with respect. So, you know, there's a lot of people that want to be leaders, that want to get elevated, but they're not prepared. I am embarrassed to say I wasn't prepared to lead University of North Carolina's basketball program. I was a head coach for one year at Notre Dame. And then I take over at North Carolina. It's a different animal. And once you're in that seat, man, it gets hot quick and everyone is watching. So that's why I think it's good. Like Roy Williams was a JV coach at North Carolina for 10 years before he became the head coach at Kansas. He got to practice and make mistakes when no one was watching. So when he got to Kansas, he was molded a little bit. He still had to practice. He still make mistakes, but they weren't going to be mistakes under a microscope that were going to be so drastic that they could be catastrophic to his career. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, you spent, was it seven years as an assistant there with him? Yeah. I was seven him. years an assistant at Kansas. As right. Seven awesome years. Yes, yes. And similarities in the programs, too, if I'm not mistaken. Weird. Obviously. Weird how similar. I tell you what, you ever go out to Lawrence, the campuses are similar. Downtown Lawrence is like ch downtown Chapel Hill. Uh, the dorms, um, the fan base, uh, the passion. Um, it, it, it's eerily similar. Similar size schools, similar size uh, curriculum, uh, in, you know, Dean Smith started there. Right. And Larry Brown coached there. Roy Williams coached there. The, the, uh, you know, uh, Brad Frederick's dad was the AD at Kansas. Brad's now an assistant. Scott Williams played at North Carolina. Roy Williams's son, uh, is just, uh, it's just weird the ties between the two schools. Between two schools. Yeah, I know for sure, for sure. So you actually touched on because I had some some uh, key leadership development skills, and and you start off with one that was really important. That's the humility. You know, everything is not about you. There's an opportunity to learn from every situation you get in. Perseverance is something that you've endured. That's really important. And being yourself is the other part. And sometimes you don't you're not able to be yourself because you're trying to live up to some expectations. And what you mentioned about being in a hot seat from the time you signed that contract, probably that seat started getting hot just because of the tradition of that program. Yeah, it, it was it was uh, I mean, you could say, well, I'm following Bill Guthridge, who was a legend in his own right. But, you know, really following Dean Smith and, and, and the challenge, the good and the bad of it. Like I said, there's good and bad and everything. The good uh, and bad was that Dean Smith and Bill Guthridge were in the building retired, but they were in the building every day. And that was good because I had them as a resource, but it was bad because if some people didn't like something I did, they went to them and they had an outlet. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I watch, uh, read about Coach K and his retirement at Duke and John Shire said he's not around. Now he's still an ambassador for the university, but he's not around the basketball program. Uh, unless John would ask him. And I think that's the ideal way to have a secession plan is right. to step away, not be visible, but be accessible if needed, because now it's John's program and not Coach K's hovering. You know, uh, there was, you know, other coaches in the past that would have an office <clears throat> Like Dean Smith, 
And then other coaches even that would have press conferences after they retire. Jim Calhoun would do that. John Thompson would do that. You know, it's like the 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 ego, you know, they didn't put it on the shelf. And that's very hard for the next coach. But I, I talk about six, the six no's of leadership in that book. And I, I talk about this in some of my public talks on leadership. There are six no's, K-N-O-W-S, of leadership. And I, I make up a story about recruiting this kid named Stevitt from Eastern Europe, uh, S-T-E-V-I-T. And I think as a coach, we all like acronyms, right? Because it, it, it makes it easier to remember. And when you tell a story, it sticks better than just trying to memorize something. So Stevitt was this player I was recruiting, and it's the six no's of leadership. Um, the S is for self. You got to know yourself. The T is you got to know your team. The E is you got to know your environment. The V is you got to know your vision. The I is you got to know your industry. And the T is the second T is you got to know the truth. You got to mine for the truth. And I think that the first one and the last one are probably the most important because you really don't get to the others until you get you know, conquer number one and number six, and that's knowing yourself. And when I was a young head coach, I didn't know myself. I didn't know my strengths or weaknesses. And, um, and, and, and I didn't mind for the truth. What do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> when a head coach walks out of a meeting, players are going to talk. They might say, oh, that was a great meeting. We're excited. Let's go fight and win. Or they might say, man, it's BS. I can't believe he's getting on us for, you know, only winning by 10 points. You know, we won. What's he, why is he happy? You know, so they start to talk behind your back. It's human nature. And I think as a leader, you got to get used to that and understand that happens. But how do you mind for the truth? So when you do leave the locker room and they're complaining about something, you can find out and you can address it in a respectful manner. That's key because I say this, if you don't mind for the truth, the truth, if you don't manage the truth, the truth will manage you right out the door. So how do you get to the truth? You got to create safe zones. You got to create avenues to get to the front line, either you directly or a conduit like an assistant coach who can develop a trust. The trainer was so critical to me because that was the person that was around the players the most in relaxed times. Players are getting food. Players are getting their ankles taped. Players are going through rehab. And the trainer is almost becomes invisible sometimes in a locker room. And I'll go to a trainer before practice or a game and say, how are they doing? Uh, they're not good. Really? What's going on? And he could say, oh, they're just tired or they not happy that the practice plan says two and a half hours. Now, a young me could get mad and explode, and then I, 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 I lose that trust. I, I, I now sabotage the relationship the trainer has with them because it gets exposed. A more mature leader, as I became more mature, or at times I was handled those situations correctly, I would go and, and talk to the players and say, hey, um, or just understand that they're a little tired. All right, maybe give them more water breaks and or maybe say, hey, guys, I know practice is two and a half hours. I got it on, but I do have several water breaks and I'll make a deal with you. If you give great energy in the first hour, I'll cut the last 30 minutes of practice out. OK. So, so that's being a player's coach. That's having emotional intelligence. That's mining for the truth and coming together as one. That's good leadership. And so that has to be practiced. And where do you learn those things? Who's your mentor? But it goes down to understanding yourself. I know that I'm intense. And I know that if I get somebody questions, you know, oh, two and a half hour practice, I'm thinking they're soft. They're not tough enough. Like, so I want to go after them, but I got to go, whoa, hold on. Don't go outside that emotional boundary. Stay inside the boundary. Think about it. React slow. 
react logically, not emotionally, and then you have a better outcome. Yeah. And that comes through practice. Yeah. Event, reaction, outcome. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you basically just kind of laid an outline of, of your coaching philosophy as a business and development coach. And I wanted to share a testimonial from someone that was a client of yours. Um, we just had Matt Doherty come to speak at our yearly sales kickoff meeting. Not only was it a great presentation and the content was spot on, but Coach Doherty took the time to learn about our organization and find about find out about our people. And by the way, that was uh, Ray Titus. I did get the name on that one. <laughs> Ray Titus played played against Ray Titus on Long Island, played at St. Dominic's. Uh, that's where Rick Pitino went to school, Tim Kempton. Uh, some some good athletes came out of St. Dom's on uh, Long Island. Yeah, Ray's a good man. Yes, yes. Well, Coach, this is exactly why I want to have you on. You, you laid some great tips and Similar, a lot of alignment with what I teach with, when it comes with young people. But I, there are some parents out there listening to that have jobs, that are CEOs of companies, that work for companies. So some great tips for them to understand, too, about leadership. And we do live in a world that's a lot different now. And to your point, it's hard to get good employees these days. So if you have good ones, you got to make sure that you hold on to them. So where I want you to share where people can get your book. OK, they can go to. Um dartycoaching.com dartycoaching.com um they can get it through the book or they go to amazon uh it's it's available on amazon um but uh yeah you mentioned parents and i don't, I don't you know i don't want to go too long but i could talk about these topics all day long if there are parents you know parents that are listening you know hopefully i i shed some drop some nuggets that they can use in the workplace. But the most important organization they lead or work in is their home. And one thing that I, um, I hate seeing, parents are, are, are really making it difficult for coaches to coach and teachers to teach. And uh, as a result, we're losing good coaches and teachers because they don't want to deal with the parents or they don't want to deal with the kids that don't listen. And then they go to the parents and instead of the parents backing the coach or the teacher, they, they complain to the coach or teacher or principal. And um, you got to allow your kids to fail. You got to allow your kids to deal with adversity because again, it's practice. It's practice for what's coming down the road. There are three guarantees in life. Death, taxes, and dealing with adversity. And it's coming. So if you don't allow your kids to navigate the rough seas of life in grammar school and high school, what's going to be like when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s? when you're not around. And so you need to practice it. Like if my kid wasn't playing, I never talked to my coach. My daughter, my daughter rode in college and swam in high school. My son played lacrosse in high school, college. I never would talk to the coaches about playing time. I, I would say that's something you got to go talk to them. You, you talk to them, you know, I'll talk to them about, like if, if I feel like there's uh, some health issue, that they're not being treated the right way, uh, physically or mentally, um, or some behavior issue, but I'm not talking to them about playing time. And so, you know, give the coach a reason to play you, you know, because all coaches want to win, right? Like that's right. the thing I want to tell parents. Don't you think I want to win? Like if I think your kid could help me win, I'd play him, but I don't think he can at this point and let him struggle a little bit, let him figure out because I, there's three things that happen when you face adversity. You can quit, you can play the victim or you can embrace it and get better. I choose to embrace it and get better. Yeah, no, 100%. Was this thing that you said you could be on this topic all day? It's actually one of my other soapbox 
box issues. Like I said, I've been at school where I am for 11 years. This is my 11th year. And several years ago, I adopted a new approach. I no longer use that term playing time. I've, con I've changed it to a new phrase. It's called contributing to the success of the team. And you know as well as I do, that can be done in one possession. It doesn't have to be 10 to 12 minutes of a game. You, you have players that play 10, 12, 15 minutes a game and give you absolutely nothing. Then you can have a kid that's in the game for 30 seconds for two minutes and give you two rebounds, a steal, and a basket. So I put the onus back on the kids. So you want to contribute to the success of the team. It's on you to do what you need to do. So you share that with them. And you also let them know we determine your contribution to the success of the team, not your parents. So what do they do? Say, Mom, Dad, this is what Coach told me I need to work on. So if you call him, he's only going to tell you what I just told you. So there's no reason to call him. I don't I don't get any conversations. I don't have conversations with parents because that responsibility, I have three coaching philosophies, player coach rapport, uh, player development, team chemistry. Those three things take place. Success is going to be ours regardless of how many games we win or lose. I love it. I love yeah. it. Now, yeah, it now let me ask you this. You didn't have those in place your first year coaching, did you? No, sir. I just implemented those. Uh, it's my 11th year five years ago. Just did it so, five years ago. So I go back to coaching is a practice. It is a skill. And, yes. and as you get older, you get better. If yes, you sir. are open to growth. Most definitely. And, and I'm so all, yeah, if you're smart, you are. You know, I mean, that that's a beautiful thing right there. You got better. Um and you talked, I think, before we started to air this, you know, you have a mentor. Yes. And, and, Coach and Sutton. Mike Sutton. Coach Mike Sutton. Sutton. Yes. And he had a mentor. And his mentor had a mentor. J.D. Uh, Barnett. And, and so, J oh, J.D. Barnett. <laughs> VCU, yeah. <laughs> um, your life is impacted by three things. The books you read, the people you meet, and the trauma in your life. You can control the first two. You can control to some degree, well, the books you read for sure. You can control who you meet. You can go to clinics. You can email people. You can reach out to them on social media. You can, you know, go to conventions. You can, you got to meet people. And then the trauma in your life, you don't control. But every time you have trauma in your life, the perspective should be, it doesn't happen to me. It's happening for me. For me. And what can I learn from this? Yes, absolutely. Great tip. Great tip. Great tip. Well, Coach George, this has been absolutely wonderful. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, sharing your leadership experience. But more importantly, you're open and honesty, which I think is really important. I think a lot of people can take away from this is that you must face the adversities that you go through in order to overcome them. It, it, it doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. I think Oprah Winfrey said that. And, uh, um, you know, uh, Nelson, I'll leave you with this. Nelson Mandela said jailed for 30 years. I think it was 30 years. He said, I never I either win or I learn. I never lose. Wow. Well, I like that. Oh, yeah. Ooh, we got to write that one down. Nug I like that. Nugget dropped, Antoine. Oh, that's a mic drop, man. That's <laughs> Hey, that's that's the slam dunk. Absolutely. I'm pointing, Absolutely. I'm pointing to the passer. All oh, right. Absolutely. Hey, thank you. And thank you for being on the Rebound Live webcast. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I have a Coach T. As always, I'm going to educate, support, and inspire the next generation of leaders. Until next episode, take care. Get your copy of Coach Matt Doherty's book, Rebound from Pain to Passion, on his website, mattdohertycoaching.com. And don't forget Coach T's book, The Ultimate Guide to Success for Preteens and Teens. It is available on Amazon.